I don't know anything about homeschooling. Do you guys have like secret clubs or these Facebook groups? We do. We do have secret clubs and handshakes as well. And we don't talk about them. Hi, I'm Anita Smith. I'm Bradley Rice. And And you're you're listening listening to to the Salesforce Salesforce for Everyone Everyone podcast. In today's show, Brad and Anita get caught up on why homeschooling and Salesforce careers go so darn well together. We are a Salesforce for Everyone podcast. And I wanted to ask this question. Does anyone have like trailhead in the curriculum for their, their kids at all? Yeah. Yeah. And Bradley shares how his family has started homeschooling and how that has made all the difference for his daughter. To see her go to school as a kindergartner and put in more hours a day than I did as a business owner was absurd in my world. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Salesforce for Everyone podcast. In today's episode, we're actually going to be mixing things up a little bit because we're going to be talking about how homeschool parents and homeschool students or aspiring homeschool parents or homeschool students can think about how to introduce a Salesforce career into that mix and how it can be really an advantage to having more flexibility or the freedom to homeschool your kids or have that dynamic in your home. So we actually have a panel today that we're going to be speaking to, and these are all tried and true experienced homeschool parents who are also Salesforce professionals. So they have definitely walked the walk, and we're going to get a chance to talk to them today. And as always, to help me cover this topic, we have Anita Smith. How's it going, Anita? Hey, I'll let our guests introduce themselves, and we'll start out with April. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Bradley and Anita. I'm really excited to be here. I love talking about Salesforce and homeschooling. So these are, you know, a combination of topics I have a lot to say a lot about. So I'm excited to be here. I'm in Western North Carolina, and I have two kids. They're 13 and 10 who have always been homeschooled. And we've kind of gone from traditional homeschooling all the way through now. We're kind of more unschooly homeschoolers. So I have a lot to say about all the different types of homeschooling. So I'm excited to be here. My Salesforce career, I started about three years ago. I joined Talent Stacker and transitioned into Salesforce from very non-Salesforce or tech-related jobs. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. We're very excited. I can't wait to pick your brain later. (laughs) All right. Our next panelist is Josh Briss. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's see. I've been in Salesforce for a couple of years now. I'm a business analyst and I've been involved with homeschooling my entire life. Um, I was homeschooled all the way through high school and then I'm also homeschooling my two daughters. I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old. My wife is stay at home with a focus on teaching them. And so far, it's been really great. And we're so excited to have that opportunity to homeschool our kids because my wife was also homeschooled as well. So yeah, it's been awesome. Oh, that's really cool. I have a follow up question. I'll I'll save it for later, though. Okay, third final panelist is Talia Johnson. Welcome. Hey, Anita and Brad, thank you so much for having me. I'm in Florida, and I actually started with Salesforce about four years ago. I joined the Talent Stacker program. I'm currently a collaboration consultant that works with companies to increase their efficiency and meetings and collaboration, but I've also been a Salesforce business analyst at PwC. My homeschooling journey has been primarily unschooling as well. And I have two sons. One is now 20 and 11. And the 20 year old has graduated technically, but unschooling is really a lifelong love of learning, self directed learning. And I will be happy to explain more about that later. All right. Awesome. So those are great intros. We appreciate it. And we've heard a lot of different terms right now. And I know we've got probably a split audience, if I had to guess, right? We've got Probably people who just listen to the podcast and they're like, we love Salesforce, so we're going to listen to every episode. And they have somewhat of an understanding about homeschool, right? It's like where you don't go to school and parents are teachers and they just teach at home, right? And obviously, we know as homeschool parents, I don't know if the audience knows this, but 
we just finished up our first year of homeschooling our daughter who is seven. And so she just finished first grade. So that was a big milestone for us. She went to school for kindergarten and it felt very uncomfortable for really the entire family. It just wasn't a good fit. So we transitioned directly into homeschooling and it was really a decision our daughter made. She saw someone getting homeschooled on a TV show that she was watching and she was like, is this a thing? And we were like, it is a thing and we are happy to do it, but we don't want to like pressure you to do it if it's not what you want to do. And she's like, I think I'd like to try it for first grade. And we're like, okay. And so we did it for a year. And the cool thing is now we just get to start like second grade whenever we want, like the guardrails are off. We can do whatever we want to do. So we took some time off because she finished early. So we kind of had our summer break in like March. And now we're getting back into this point where we took a break at a really non-conventional time per what I was used to going to public school my entire life. And we just get to choose when we pick up for second grade and we can do that way later or way early or whatever we want to do. So anyway, what I wanted to do is say that, you know, there are so many of these terms that I don't fully understand them. And I don't think a lot of even homeschool families, sometimes these things I don't think have complete definitions, right? Like it's different for different families and how they handle things in their own situations. Like I'm sure we're going to get into this, but there's full-blown communities for like community homeschooling or unschooling or world schooling or whatever else. So we're going to have people who have never heard of this stuff before or have a brief understanding. We're going to have people who have been in it for a lifetime. And like Josh was saying, was homeschooled himself and his wife. So there are so many different dynamics that go into this. So I'm, I'm really excited about this selfishly because I know I'm going to learn so much, but I'm also really excited because I think our audience is going to be opened up to an entirely new concept that maybe they haven't heard of before or they've lightly heard of. And I feel like this is sort of like the financial independence conversation where you can take an idea, if you haven't heard of that, I'm so sorry for bringing in another thing you haven't heard of, but this idea of early retirement or not needing to work anymore. And that blew my mind when I found out about that. And homeschool, very similar, like absolutely blew my mind the amount of freedom and flexibility it can introduce. And the same thing with Salesforce careers, so much freedom and flexibility that's introduced. I feel like these things just go hand in hand. So all right, that's enough for me. I want to take it back to you guys. And we're going to do this classic thing where I think I'm going to pitch this to Talia and let her kick it off because she sort of said she was interested in doing that, but at least alluded to. Talia, if you wouldn't mind giving us like, what are the most common, you know, homeschooling types? Because you guys both like April and Talia, you both said unschooling at this point, right? So what are the major styles of homeschooling? And if, if you don't mind trying to break that down for us. Yeah, sure. I think we could start thinking about it as a spectrum. There are different terms that people use, but there's a lot of in between and people who mix and match. So at one end, we might have the traditional homeschoolers who might be recreating somewhat of a school-like atmosphere at home using curriculum that maybe they purchased or maybe was provided by the state. Then in addition to that, religious homeschoolers who have yet another curriculum that includes their religious texts or parts of their belief. And then we have eclectic homeschoolers who might be taking things from all sorts of directions. And then unschoolers who may or may not use a curriculum, but the difference there is that it's what the child is interested in learning and when. And it's not based on how old they are or what they should be doing in such and such grade. And then we might have radical unschoolers at the far end there who even take away that relationship of the authority figure parent and making bedtimes are optional and, and all kinds of things like that. You let them learn, you let them kind of live as kind of equals in your family. And one thing that I have done is I've kind of grown into an unschooler. And over time, it's been difficult and challenging throughout the time. It's not easy to let your kid just do whatever they want because you have so much pressure from society. But a lot of people do kind of swing between different styles as they grow and learn. I don't know anything about homeschooling. I don't, I don't even have friends that were homeschooled. Sorry, I'm so confused right now. I'm trying to wrap my head, my little Asian head around this because I grew up, you know, with grades and exams and like, that's what was important. How does that work? Do you have to take exams at some point? Do you graduate? Can you tell me the logistics of that? It's going to be different in every state. 
So my state, for example, you have to do end of year testing, but through the year with my kids, they've never taken a test from me. We've never done it. We do the end of year testing that the state requires, but not one person has ever looked at that test from the state. It's just a requirement to do. And they always do amazing, which always blows my mind because we don't do any formal curriculum and they somehow are picking up all this knowledge. So yeah, but it varies greatly. Talia is in Florida. I'm sure it's different there. And I'm not sure where you are, Josh, but each state varies on some are very strict. Some have no regulations at all, but we just pass them up to the next, like my kids going to this grade. This, like I'm just passing them up every year. They take their end of year test. If there's something like blaring, then I'm like, oh gosh, they can't spell at all. Maybe I'll like <laughs> help a little more in spelling the next year or something like that. But yeah, no grades. They get a pass fail or you just move them along as they go. And they are learning. They don't have to be quizzed to know that they're learning. So yeah, I'm in Minnesota and yeah, I grew up taking end of year exams and it was always like, oh, like here's the big scary exam at the end of the year. But I and my siblings always did fine and, in fact, excelled in most categories. And yeah, I haven't had to do that with my five-year-old or three-year-old yet, but I imagine there will be something like that that we will be doing with them as well. So I feel like we've, num- number one, thank you guys. Like That is a lot to take in. And if you're listening right now and maybe you're newer to these concepts, and I'll admit, like I, I'm fairly new to these concepts. Like I'm sure that any one of our panelists will tell you that being one year in is fresh. So We have done, I would say it's probably some balance of like eclectic, as Talia described it on the spectrum. Like we do traditional, we have some curriculum for certain subjects, but a lot of it is interest-led or inspired learning. And I think we have, I don't know, I'll find out later, I guess, you know, doing first grade, having just finished up first grade, I feel like we have a lot more freedom with that because even the standard curriculum for first grade is like an hour a day. So it's even if we kept a grade level, there's so much more time left in the day compared to the seven hours a day, 35 hours a week that she would be at school. We really only need maybe five to eight hours a week to cover all the curriculum. Then we can move along into all of the other things that the world has to offer, right? So getting into that interest letter inspired. But I also want to keep in mind that this is a Salesforce for Everyone podcast, right? So I think we've covered some of the bases. I'll ask you guys later, probably towards the end of the episode, to give us some recommended resources. So just putting that in the back of your mind. And I want to move towards how a Salesforce career has intertwined into this, I'll call it a lifestyle. I don't know if it's fair to call it that, but I'm going to call it a lifestyle. I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe I'll I'll pick on you, Josh, and say, you know, how has becoming a Salesforce professional, how did that intertwine in that decision? Was it a decision you made to be a remote worker because you knew that homeschooling was going to be part of what you wanted to do with your family? How do you balance? I know you mentioned you specifically, and I don't think it's going to be the same for everyone. Like your your spouse is at home, right? So how does that work? Like how did that feed into your decision to be a Salesforce professional? And how does it work with you being a Salesforce professional and sort of intertwining that into also being a homeschool parent? Yeah. Even before my wife and I had kids, we knew that we were probably going to homeschool our kids, provided they were into it and benefiting from it. That was our plan. I came from a eight-year grocery retail career. And as my girls were getting older, we realized man, we have just a lack of resources in our family when it comes to time, energy, opportunity to be together as a family. And a big part of that was because I was working retail hours. They were inconsistent. I'd find myself working weekends, nights, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think this was the point where my daughters were three and one. You know, I started having discussions with my wife about, okay, what other opportunities might we have? And Salesforce popped into our lives as an opportunity. And that's where I really dove into it, thinking this is going to be really good for our family, not just for homeschooling, but overall for connection with my family, being together with my family and having more of that quality time. But I really couldn't have possibly understood how big those impacts would be, especially when you, you you mentioned the remote aspect. 
it's so amazing that I can work an eight hour day and then walk upstairs to my family and have time to check in with my kids, read them a book or do like, I've started to do like science lessons with my girls and I can actually find time to do that now because I'm not commuting. So yeah, it's huge. Being in Salesforce and working remotely changes a lot when it comes to homeschooling. I'm curious what the shift was for April because your kids are 13 and 10 and you're homeschooling even before your Salesforce career. So how did that or did it change once you switched to like a Salesforce job? So yeah, I wanted to come here and represent for all the single moms wanting to do this too because it can happen for you as well. And I get lots of questions on different Facebooks about, oh, I'm single mom, can I homeschool? And I love kind of talking about that. But yeah, I worked part time when the kids were younger. And then, you know, I went through a divorce. And so at that point is when I was like, well, it was really important to me to keep homeschooling and trying to figure out how am I going to, you know, (laughs) have a career that's remote, that pays enough money. And around the same time, I just happened to hear about Salesforce and Talent Stacker on two separate things online. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to check it out. And that's kind of how that whole transition started. You know, I have my kids full time. It's let me continue to have this really flexible, amazing career and still be able to homeschool and still have this time and flexibility for my kids. Like they're really involved in sports and I've never had a problem like having to leave to go take them to this, that, or the other. It's always been really flexible with that. So my transition started out of necessity, I think, (laughs) about needing to have a better paying career and being able to homeschool at the same time. So that's kind of what led me into Salesforce. Before that, I, I didn't even look at a computer all day, and now I'm on a computer all day. I was not in tech. I had a psychology degree. I worked a lot with kids and just customer service jobs and things like that when they were younger part-time, which, you know, let me homeschool. But yeah, so even the single moms or single parents out there, it gives so much flexibility that you can still even homeschool if it's just you. So, I mean, it's just so great and has given so many opportunities to me that I'm really thankful for. So that's, I mean, it's incredible, right? Like that's what I envision when I think we were thinking about having this episode was that level of, I don't, I think it's an inspiration across the board, right? Like it's inspiring for parents to, I think number one, coming out of the gates with describing the different types of schooling. I think that's going to be really mind opening for a lot of people, sort of like how Anita reacted. Like what? Like, wait, how how do we, and there's so many questions. I even have questions. We've done certain things. We also have my wife's brother who is 16 years old and taking him from, you know, determining does he want to do virtual school or homeschool or continue with high school going into uh, now just finishing up 10th grade. And there's so many things like Anita said, dependent on the state of, well, do these credits transfer and do we have to stick to the subjects that he was going to have to stay on track? And is it worth it to maybe rock the boat when we're just a couple of years out from finishing this thing off? And There's so many things that come up and we could go for, I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of podcasts that cover episode after episode after episode on these topics. So it goes deep and it's dependent on state and it's dependent on so many different things. But one thing I do want to sort of understand a little bit is how do you go through that transition, especially I think as a single parent, that sounds unreal, like the amount of focus and your why would have to be so strong, I imagine, to really dial in and go through with that trend. Because transitioning to a Salesforce career has its own challenges, period. But how do you guys go from wherever you were to having children, you already have the kids, and then you decide, I'm going to transition careers and maybe also deciding I'm going to homeschool my kids after they've already been in school, potentially. How do you juggle that? How do you manage that? Because we talk about people who maybe have the full-time job and then They have to juggle the full-time job and maybe having kids in public school while they transition into a career. But I would say, how is this different than that? Just how do you manage that? How do you structure your life in a way that allows you to learn this entirely new thing, entire new career path? Because I can imagine a lot of listeners are going like, this sounds awesome, right? Like I would love to do some type of unschooling with my kids and that sounds healthier for my family, but I want to do this career transition too. That's why I'm listening to this podcast. 
can I do both? Is that advisable from our panel here to try to switch to homeschooling and also switch into a Salesforce career? Like, what would your advice be? It was a lot of late nights, <laughs> I won't lie, of working during the day and then squeezing in some homeschool lessons and then kind of working Salesforce stuff at night. The good thing about transitioning into Salesforce and Talent Stacker is that you could do it at your own pace, really. I took a little bit longer than maybe everyone else did, and that was fine. So, you know, I think it's definitely possible. You have to, I was really structured with my time. And maybe during that year, I didn't have as maybe as much flexibility with kind of doing all these extra things with my kids, but I felt like it was worth it in the long run to make a little bit of sacrifice during that time and then having the opportunity to have this more flexible career in the end. One interesting aspect of homeschooling is that you are instilling in your kids a love of learning. And then at the same time, if you're doing Salesforce and learning this new career, you are learning as well alongside of them. And you are inspiring them, seeing mom learn something new, be challenged by something, get through it, get frustrated, look for help, whatever it takes. That's exactly what they should be doing. And like I said before, the aspect of homeschooling that I'm really interested in is is the self-directed learning. And if I demonstrate self-directed learning to them, I know that they can also be inspired by me. So if you're transitioning to homeschooling, and you're trying to transition to self-directed learning, you are basically a student with them. And they're learning whatever they're interested in, you're learning whatever you're interested in. And April said as well, there is no timeline with unschooling. You don't have to learn a certain thing by this date. And in many states, the requirements are very easy to accomplish in a year. For many students who are at home, they learn far faster than kids in school sorry to say, but they don't necessarily learn the same exact things, but they'll surprise you with what they do learn uh, watching YouTube (laughs) several hours a day sometimes. And I also want to stress that every family is different and your child may have learning issues, developmental challenges. They could be younger than my kids were when I started doing Salesforce. The younger ones obviously need a certain kind of attention that older kids don't necessarily need. They can be more independent. So I have a nine-year gap between my kids. And even when my kid was quite young, I could have said, okay, older unschooler, you're going to just be with younger unschooler right now while a mom goes and does something that she needs to focus on. Then I could come back and do things with them. But that is one way that you can do it. But I can't say that people with little tinies all around are going to have an easy time doing this, honestly. Trying to learn something or even work at home with little kids, unless you have someone to be with them during the hours that you're going to need to focus, it's going to be really challenging. I do want people to know that once you get a high paying Salesforce job, you might be able to afford to pay a 15 year old homeschooler to come over to your house and play with your two year old while you're working, okay? or kind of fill in the gaps between you and your spouse or partner. Those are things that you can do to make it work. Yeah, just to tag on to that, when my kids were younger, we definitely used co-ops in the area. I I feel fortunate that we're in an area with lots of co-ops and a huge homeschooling community. So there's lots of options. There was even just, hey, other homeschooling family that I am friends with now, do you want to do like a kid swap this day or or that kind of thing, but co-ops that have drop-off or even like if they're not drop-off, you can sit and kind of work while they're doing the co-op class or have a park play day and they're running at the park and I'm on my laptop. The flexibility, like, you know, we keep saying that it's just so flexible being able to learn this new career and don't put it like a timeline, you know, if you have to take it slower, that's fine. If you have little kids, most of us know how difficult that can be just not doing anything else, but doing that. And so adding anything extra onto that, it might take you longer, but that's okay. Yeah, I agree. With a laptop, you can go anywhere. You can take your kid to Taekwondo homeschooling class in the middle of the day, and you can go to that co-op. In my case, it was a self-directed learning community that I started here. And I was able to do my own thing while my kid was occupied having fun with other kids and learning and all kinds of things were going on. And I would hunker down and and get some work done. And there'd be all kinds of activity around me. And 
I would occasionally scoot off into my car and, you know, take a meeting or whatever it was if I was working, depending if I was working or learning. But I definitely think that it can work if you have support like that. It does take a village in many cases to make this work. Just to follow up on what Talia was saying about income and the opportunity that that can provide you. I mean, if you go from a situation where you and your significant other are both working 50K a year jobs, and then all of a sudden one is making 100K, that can free the other person up to be the teacher on a regular basis. And if you've gone from a out of the house job to a remote working in the house job, you now have extra time savings where you can be a support person to your partner who's teaching. I don't think that can be understated. That gives you a ton of resources just from the income perspective. But also, you know, it's not something that you're going to do completely on your own. April mentioned homeschooling co-ops. There's all sorts of resources out there. There's communities to come alongside you and help you. I mean, just randomly On my street alone, we've got like two or three homeschooling families at different stages of of homeschooling with different age kids. And that's just complete happenstance. But there's probably communities all around you that you're not even aware of yet and all kinds of resources that are just waiting to be tapped. Is homeschooling a lot bigger than I'm aware of? All these co-ops and like, these are all new terms to me. Yeah, Talia. Yeah, huge. It's an, an underworld city. Do you guys have like secret clubs or are these Facebook we do. groups? Yeah. Have have secret clubs. <laughs> and handshakes as well. And we don't talk about them after we go to the club. And uh, homeschooling. Yeah, you can find, I when I was getting started, my son was young, you know, three or so, started to look for community of people who weren't sending their kid to pre-K or daycare or whatever it was. I was already looking for those people who were kind of on the fringe. Back then it was Yahoo groups. I started one because there wasn't one. My recommendation to everybody who can't find a group is start a group. You start a group and everybody who's been looking and couldn't find it will find you. And now you've got those people. But in many cases, since the internet has progressed a lot since Yahoo groups back then, you will find a plethora of groups in major cities. Outside of that area, you're going to have to be a little bit more creative and figure out where they are. You're going to find somebody, ask around. It's kind of like, do you know somebody that knows somebody? (laughs) I know a guy and he's got this group. It can be tricky to find in certain places, but I would say that if I was looking right now in a new city, I would go to Facebook first or Google, really. And then you might find different places where they're hanging out. Meetup.com is a good one, too. That's where I originally found our preschool homeschool group and but I feel like now it's getting less and less harder to find these. I just feel like even in our like more remote areas of Western North Carolina, there's a homeschool group <laughs> in every single one. It's definitely, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's growing so quickly homeschooling. So they're out there and you'll find your people if you look hard enough. Yeah, I just want to chime in that that's definitely been our experience is that I'll use the word Talia used, fringe. It felt like a fringe decision, especially when you're surrounded by, if you're already in public school, private school, or any kind of traditional going on site to go to school, then you may not necessarily be surrounding yourself with the homeschool families, right? Like that's not where they are. They're not at public school necessarily. So community is something that is coming up right now. And community is also huge in the Salesforce ecosystem. Like if you haven't figured that out yet, then like community is going to help you, right? Because There's so many parallels in life. There's just another topic of life, right? It's another huge topic of life. And careers are a big topic in life. And also schooling and education is a big topic in life. And when you get into these massive systems, there are always things going on. And again, you know, going back to what has already been mentioned with the expansion of the internet and how we've been able to use that, these groups have become so widely available. And you know, getting into these nuances, like if you're aspiring to be a Salesforce professional, even if you're not homeschooling, you are going to get onto Trailhead and then it's going to click sometimes, but then it's going to be really confusing sometimes. And it's just getting through the technical learning, but also the interviews and networking and how do I actually do my job once I'm there and all these things, community feeds into that. And as soon as we think we know everything, suddenly three months later, we don't know anything and we have to go out to our communities and get feedback and 
what do you know? There's a hundred people who have already been through whatever you're going through and you can get that different advice from different perspectives. It's the exact same thing as what we've seen with homeschool in just one year, right? Just one year of this is that you think you've got it. You bought the curriculums, you went to the homeschool store and you're like, we got this dialed in. And then it's like, oh man, I have some questions. Like, this is not going the way I thought it was. Like my kid's not excited about this topic. Like, in fact, I hate this curriculum. Like, this is just awful to listen to. And you want to teach them something else, but then you feel like you're falling behind if you're trying to follow a traditional path. Cause you're like, oh my God, my kid's two weeks behind and they haven't been doing curriculum. And I haven't found the time to find a new curriculum yet. And I think that's where everybody's like, yeah, unschooling Brad, eclectic Brad, stop trying to do school at home and forcing something to work that clearly doesn't work. So I think that's the cool thing about homeschooling. And so going back to the community side, we were blown away. We found out that our daughter can do all the clubs and sports at the local public school that she's assigned to. So you don't have to miss out on all the extracurriculars. And I'm sure that differs by county and state and all that fun stuff. But there's also so many communities. There are world school communities and homeschool communities and unschool communities, and they're all different. Our museum in Houston has homeschool days and homeschool lessons. Our trampoline parks have homeschool only hours. Our everything, the library has homeschool only moments. Like it's incredible. You are surrounded by homeschool support and you don't even know it. Even if you're not a homeschool family, like you are surrounded by an entire community of support right in front of you and you probably just haven't tapped into it. So when I say don't worry about it, like if you feel like homeschooling might be for you, I would love to hear from you guys. Everyone has their hand raised, by the way. I know you can't hear their hands raised on the show. Everyone has their hands raised. So I know there's a lot to say. So I'm going to toss it back over to you guys, but I would love for one of you guys to answer this real quick and then segue into whatever it is you have your hand raised for. Should people who are thinking about becoming homeschool families, they're interested, are they welcome in these community groups? Is there a certain type of community group they should join to just sort of start asking those questions or hopefully searching first kind of thing? Oh man, yes, they are so welcome. Homeschool families are just hungry for other people to come and join and experience what we're already experiencing. You know, we want it for other families in whatever way works for them. We're not trying to bring you into our particular little corner of homeschooling and say like, this is how you should be doing it. We want you to come into homeschooling for you to figure out what's best for your family, to figure out what's best for your kids. How do they learn? And then there's all sorts of communities to kind of circle back to what Talia was saying about, you know, the whole spectrum of homeschooling in different ways that you can homeschool. There are co-ops and groups for people who are coming at homeschooling from a religious aspect. There's ones for people who are coming from a secular perspective, and there's ones for meeting in person and meeting online. Yeah, there's endless amounts of options out there. And my side note was, Bradley, you mentioned the homeschool store, and I just had to look at Anita because I was like, she's going to be like, what the heck? And then she, she's mouthing homeschool store. I don't even know what you're talking about. So you might have to tell us what homeschool store you're talking about. <laughs> awesome. Tali has got her hand up, so I'm going to let her run. But we literally, I'm not going to like riff on it like I always do, but we literally have a homeschool supply store that just has endless books, curriculums, ancillary supplies, anything you need for pre-K through 12th grade and even like college level learning, like to support curriculum wise or reading books, whatever you need, they've got it. That's so awesome. That means there's a lot of people in your area to support that store. So your question was, are people welcome? A new people welcome? Absolutely. And again, there is one caveat that sometimes religious groups want you to sign a statement of faith before you join. So whatever their statement says, they want you to kind of commit to that, that you believe this. And other than that, most groups don't have these kinds of requirements. <laughs> and they're really excited to have fresh blood, new kids for their kids to play with that are the same age and same you know, interest or whatever. Sometimes you'll have a, a friend that grows up and moves away and you're just like, 
shoot, I need another 12 year old who likes Minecraft, you know? So new people coming in is great, especially when you're not living where April lives or in the Houston area where there's just tons of people to draw from. My small city, we have less people, we have a good solid community, but there's not just endless options. So I've seen people, they put on Facebook, like, I have a such and such year old, this gender child, sometimes we want to find others of around this age between 10 and 13, who are interested in boo, 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 because they've sort of lost contact with some other friends, or they're new to it or new to the area. And they just, it's really, if you have a solid couple families that you know, that homeschool, you're kind of set beyond that, everything is gravy big groups that meet regularly with where somebody's organizing all this junk, you know, that is intense to organize. Let me tell you, I've done it. If you have someone who's already kind of handled that stuff for you, you're in an amazing area to homeschool. So we are a Salesforce for Everyone podcast. And I wanted to ask this question. Does anyone have like trailhead in the curriculum for their, their kids at all? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Now, I tried really hard. My oldest is a girl. She's 13. She is not super interested. <laughs> but my son, who is super into computers, he was, oh gosh, how old was he? He pretty much like did, tra- like, obviously, I was there doing it, but he was so into it. He still is really into it. He likes to look at what I'm doing for work. So I wouldn't say that we have like a curriculum and he's 10. So he's not like going through and doing it by himself. But I would not be surprised if he ends up a Salesforce professional himself. He's super into it. I'm still working on court, my daughter. So (laughs) we'll see how it goes with her. But it's a great thing to know. I just feel like I could just everyone learn Salesforce. Like it opens up so many opportunities for you even if you don't want to be a Salesforce administrator. There's so many other paths you can go with it. Obviously, we all know that. But I think it's a a great tool for maybe a little bit older homeschool children. (laughs) For sure. Yeah, I was thinking when you mentioned doing this with your kids, Salesforce or Trailhead, that just like as adults, we want to kind of get more experience. We create dev orgs and come up with a concept for an app that has some relationship to our life and is interesting to us. And so you can do the same exact thing with a kid who maybe has, for example, my child with 15,000 Magic the Gathering cards, and maybe he's now going to catalog them in a dev org and do some kind of thing where he can find them or look up certain things and create decks maybe even. And so you do something with these cards and there might be some way to use Salesforce to do something with them. Maybe the value you grab from an online source, there could be endless possibilities with the different interests that kids have where you say, okay, you want to start a business. Maybe you make stickers and you sell them. Now let's use Salesforce to track your products. You know, you can think of all these different things. Again, it is probably better suited to an older kid or just someone who's really interested. I personally wouldn't want to force my kid to use Salesforce every day if they were you know, crying about it. But I did have my older son. I found this guy on LinkedIn who had an apprenticeship program with teens. And he had this specific curriculum sort of thing and, and projects that they would do. But unfortunately, it kind of ended just as my son was about to get into it. And it didn't open back up again. The man who was running it, again, like I said about the time it takes to do special things for young people. It's not often well paid. And he had to kind of move away from that because he needed to focus on his own income generating activities. But it was a really great idea if someone else out there wants to start that and has more support financially, they can start it. But it was awesome. And he he was on Trailhead for a while. And again, he's going to be a musician, it seems. And so it's harder to figure out like how that would fit in. But we've, he's definitely on the computer a lot using all kinds of software. And so I think having 21st century skills with computers, for one thing, is essential for kids these days. I don't think that should get in the way of them getting outside and getting dirty and all those good things. So we need to balance that. If we're going to say trailhead, they might get addicted, you know, guys. So they might just be like, no, one more hour, mom. <laughs> They make it so cute with the characters. My son was really into it. 
I hope my <laughs> kids get addicted to Trailhead. <laughs> my girls are a little too young to start it just yet, but honestly, I cannot wait until they're old enough to start learning. And if I had teens in my household, I would absolutely be like, yeah, this is part of your weekly schooling and you have to at least give this a try before we even talk about community college or a four-year degree. <laughs> I think this is so interesting. I want to circle back on a couple of topics here because it, and, and it is very enticing to force your children to get on Trailhead because we're in it. So you guys should be in it. I wanted to point out one thing. Patrick Amos comes to mind. I don't think he'll mind me calling him out. We actually used to be not neighbors, but like neighborhood neighbors when I lived in Florida. And at the time he was in high school and I actually had the pleasure of meeting up with him and his dad and his whole family got in on the Salesforce thing, right? Like they heard about it from someone. I think he had a side, his brother, Patrick's brother had a side hustle detailing cars and he was detailing a car for somebody who was a Salesforce professional. And they told him about it and he brought it home. And then they went online and they were like, oh, there's this guy named Bradley who also lives in our town who tells people all about Salesforce. And so we got connected and I sat down with them and we had coffee and uh, hung out for a little while and the whole family got hooked. So just a few months later, Patrick, his brother, his mom, and his dad were all administrator certified. And I don't recall, he can correct me on this on wherever he sees this and can uh, comment, but I know he ended up landing a Salesforce job before he finished high school. And I'm not going to call him out on what the salary was, but let's just say he got paid crazy money compared to what any high school or college graduate can expect to make. And this dude was like 17. It was crazy. And I know he still chose to go to college and sort of balance that with his job. But I know by the time he, you know, was like a sophomore in college, you know, we know it just gets silly after you're in this for two or three years. His dad also landed a job and I'll leave it at that. I don't, I don't, I don't think his brother went, went through with it or his mom went through with it, but I know his dad also landed a job through Salesforce. So the whole family, I think they have their own family owned business and they just sort of abandoned it and said, you know what? The Salesforce thing sounds pretty cool. And I was going to mention something. I've seen this in, in forums and groups and stuff. And I've seen people come from other technology backgrounds and they'll go, why silo yourself into Salesforce? And I can hear those voices also saying like, why would you teach your kids just Salesforce? Well, on Trailhead, why don't you teach them HTML or you know something more broadly used? And we talked about it lightly. You guys talked about it lightly, but I just want to like push it home. It's not about Salesforce. It's not about the platform called Salesforce. When you learn this stuff, you are learning business processes. So what am I talking about? You're learning generally, like we're talking about a universal knowledge of how do businesses get leads and how do they capture that data about those leads and decide what to do with them? How do they nurture them? How do they sell to them? Once they become customers, how do they track what they bought? Once they become customers, how do we sell them into a different product? How do we support them with the products or services that they already have? How do we report on that? How do we bring dashboards to life? How do we get that on mobile for management so that everybody can see into the business? And that's why you learn it. That's why Trailhead, I think, is a good fit for any homeschool sort of business curriculum because it's not about Salesforce necessarily. It's going to lead, it will lead to that, of course, but it has a lot, just like Salesforce generally does. And so to those same people who are like, why learn one technology? It's not one technology. What if Salesforce goes away in 10 years? It's not, these skills are transferable. It's not about logging into Salesforce. It's about all of the skills, knowledge, about business, everything that goes into this thing. So that's why you learn it. And one more little aside, and then once again, we have hands raised like crazy. So we're going to head over to the actual people you want to hear from. But we have chickens, as most people know, or who have followed me on LinkedIn or TikTok. And we get eggs and we have way too many eggs. We have like 30 chickens. So we're getting like 20 to 25 eggs a day and we cannot eat that many eggs. So we sell these eggs to our neighbors. So they'll come and they'll, I mean, we have neighbors who own like restaurants who will buy like, 20 dozen eggs at a time. Just like literally we sold a five gallon bucket full of eggs to a restaurant owner, just to take them all. But anyway, we tracked that in a Salesforce app. And that was part of a homeschooling initiative that we had. And it was so simple. It was just like, we have contacts who are our neighbors. They purchase products, which are our eggs. And we can sell those in certain quantities for certain dollar amounts. And it's such an easy thing to track. And we were able to get that on the mobile app 
on her iPad. And so she would be walking around with her iPad like a clipboard and collecting eggs. And then when she's done collecting, she can just type in, I collected. All she says is like eggs collected. And it automatically knows the date because it's today. And she types in however many eggs she collected and clicks submit. And it just says how many eggs were collected each day. And then when she sells, how many eggs to which contact in our system, which one of our neighbors and click submit for how much. And that's it. And now everything is tracked. It's such a simple business process from actually getting the items. We had some aspirations to get into like food cost, overhead, maintenance of the chicken coops, or like buying hay or feed and things like that. We didn't go that far, but it was really fun just to track egg collection and egg sales with our neighbors. All right, I'm going to hand it off to you guys. April, why don't you jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about teaching. It wasn't for me about like shoving Salesforce down my kids' throats or anything, or like you must learn Salesforce. It's just another tool, another career path they know of, another thing they'll won't be so foreign to them. I had no idea of this whole world of careers, this tech world, the Salesforce product teams. I, I didn't even know they existed until I heard about Salesforce and kind of got into my career. And gosh, I wish somebody would have been like, hey, look at the Salesforce when I was getting out of high school or college and how different my financial life and career path would have been had I known these careers out there. So, you know, just touching back to homeschooling, I just try to expose them to as many different things as I can, whether that be computer or going to a farm or, you know, just the whole range of this is what's out in the world. There's so many choices for you. Computers are such a big part of our world and this industry is such a big part of our world that it just opens up so many doors. I thought it was really important to kind of, once I knew about it and learned it, to pass that on to my kids if they want to. Like I said, my daughter, not really interested, but she knows about it. (laughs) She knows it's there. My son has more interest. So, you know, it's still like, I'm not going to force it on my daughter, but at least she has the knowledge that it's there. She knows what I do. So maybe that will be an option for her, you know, when, as she gets older or out there looking for a career. So I just wanted to point that it's not so much like narrowing them into Salesforce, just another thing they can learn, another thing they know of, another career path that maybe they wouldn't have known about otherwise. Yeah. And this kind of brings up the idea that learning is so much better, in my opinion, when you have a practical use for it. So that whole concept of entrepreneurship can cover the whole spectrum of an education. You're learning about marketing, you're learning about interacting with other people and you know, however you're selling it. And then the tracking, the bookkeeping, the math that comes in. I am disturbed by how abstract education is for kids. They are given these out of context things continuously over and over again, and they're supposed to care about it. And they're supposed to do well and pay attention and keep doing it. And really, the only thing that keeps them going is one, truancy. It's illegal to not go to school unless you are officially designated as a homeschooler. And two, the carrots dangling in front of them to get grades and rewards for achievement. But other than that, they don't have a lot of motivation to learn these I think, arbitrary topics and curriculum that is given in traditional schooling. And oftentimes when they get out of school, when they graduate, they don't even know what they want to do with their lives. They are confused about how to be motivated to read a single book. There's nothing interesting to them in the world without someone saying, you have to do this by this date and you'll get a star. When you have a child who's interested in something and then you say, we could create something based on what you're interested in and it leads to a business idea, and then it might lead to naturally using Salesforce org involved in that. You're not saying out of context, let's learn Salesforce. You're saying, here's a reason why we might want to use Salesforce. We could even start with you just setting up the dev org and showing them by hand, not even going to Trailhead at first. Now you're interested in this because you can see how it applies to your life and why it's interesting to you because we created a dev org all about Magic the Gathering cards. You want to learn how to add an extra thing, whiz bang, automation, whatever you want to do. Well, now I'm going to point you to Trailhead and say, you can learn about that right now. Just like you go to YouTube to learn about everything, my son, which they do, and my husband and everybody else I know, (laughs) you go and you find out the answer for yourself as an adult. 
you can do that as a kid as well when you're homeschooled. And you have so much more time to devote to these interests than kids who are in school all day, being shuffled around between classes, and then having a bunch of homework that may or may not be important. I think I know where you're going with finishing off that statement, and I don't mind being the one. And I know we could all go off on tangents, and I think personal situations too. And I don't think anyone here is not aware that there is some amount of, for me, it's definitely, I felt like there was a privilege to be able to be a homeschool parent at first, because it felt like I had so much opportunity. Now, was a lot of that intentional and designed, but did I also come from an upbringing where I had to default, where I probably was more inclined to have these opportunities than other people. Yeah, yes. So with that in mind, though, when a lot of times I think, especially now that we are involved in homeschool communities for this short amount of time, there is a lot of that questioning the norm, especially in my case. I haven't worked full time since my daughter was born. I was dedicated to Evelyn before she was born. It was just a natural instinct. You don't have to feel that way. It's just the way I felt. And I just knew that if I could do anything not to work full time, I was going to go for that. And that was a privilege. I had this opportunity not to work full time and latched onto that. And so to see her go to school as a kindergartner and put in more hours a day than I did as a business owner was absurd in my world. I was getting off work and had to wait three and a half hours to go pick up my daughter. And then for the first time in my life, or for the first time in my adult life, I had to commute again. I had to commute her to school and commute back home. I'd been working remote for over 10 years. And now I have to take her to school every morning. And that was over 30 minutes each way. Sometimes it depends on traffic, right? So you get stuck in line and you got to wait in car rider line and all this kind of stuff. So I just felt like in my particular situation that my kid had been taken from me. And if she was going to say, hey, I don't think this is for me, then goodness gracious, you better bet I jumped on that. And I think the other thing was, you mentioned a lot of things, Talia, and I think we could go for days on the importance of each particular subject. And could we not substitute out financial literacy as a man? I don't, I know, I know there's probably listeners right now who are like, my school has financial literacy. And it's like, yeah, I get it. They get it for one semester and one grade. I would think in my family that financial literacy probably deserves more than one semester in one grade. It's a huge part of our lives. It's a massive part of what leads to divorce and relationships, financial issues. It's a big part of what leads to stress and taking jobs that we have to have and not being able to afford things because we didn't know how to save or not being able to retire because we didn't know what retirement accounts were, like all these things. That's one topic, right? We could go for days about all the other topics. And then you get into religion-based, right? For some people who, or just value-based, don't even call it religion-based, right? Value-based learning. And they, they just have specific values in their families that they want to teach their kids about that is not going to be taught in a standard curriculum. And there, so there are so many reasons for that. But I think even on top of that, we notice that our daughter's emotional freedom was being taken away that she was not allowed to have extreme emotion in a classroom setting. She was not allowed to be overly sad, overly mad, overly excited for long periods of time, overly anything. The only thing she was allowed to do is operate within the mandatory spectrum of what that classroom or that teacher or that school allowed those kids to operate in. So she would get in the car almost every day after school and there would be a tantrum. For no reason, right? My seatbelt buckle won't work. My shirt's too tight. My pants are rolled up, like whatever it was. And it would be a meltdown. And it didn't take long for us to figure out it wasn't about the pants. It wasn't about the seatbelt buckle. It was about those emotions being bottled up for an entire day for seven hours straight, then getting in a car for a commute. That drives adults crazy. And then we expect our kids to just deal with it. Right. So there is definitely a lot of double expectations that I think we've noticed and the people around us have noticed where, yes, parents, but also teachers and school administration put on these kids where we hate it as adults, but we expect these kids to just buckle down and get it done and don't worry about it. So that'll be the rant that I think maybe some of us want to avoid, but that's (laughs) been a big part of our decision making to why it feels so obvious that we at least have to give this 
a good chance because we do have the privilege and opportunity to give this a good chance. And I, I recognize that not everyone has that, but if you do, at least let this be food for thought. Yeah, there's so much overlap with this transition into a new career and with homeschooling and that looking outside of the norm. We're doing something that most people have never heard of. They look at us cockeyed like, what? Sales, what? And you have to be confident enough to step outside and be that weirdo when you're a homeschooler. Like April has said, it has become more well-known. People know a normal homeschooler that isn't a weird kid, that the stereotype is they're unsocialized and they don't know how to do anything. You know, really. But it's getting more common that people have an exemplary homeschooler that they know that they can say, wow, homeschooling really works because I know this kid. And with Salesforce, we're coming at something that is new to people. Our family question, what the heck are you doing? Why are you spending so much time? Is, is this really going to work? Joining Talent Stacker is, I'm sure, like that for many people. It was a leap of faith to trust in whatever Kool-Aid Brad was giving out and to trust that it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I do think they connect extremely well, Salesforce and homeschooling, because they're both about thinking outside of the box. And once you start thinking outside of the box, you find yourself doing it more and more and more. And so while there's a really good chance that my girls might have no interest in Salesforce, I think they've got a slightly higher chance of being interested in Salesforce because they're already being raised to think outside of the box. And there's so many other applications to how you think outside of the box with homeschooling. I mean, just wait until you realize that you can go on vacation during the off season every time. (laughs) And you're always showing up to the museums when they're empty. And you just start living this whole different life where you're like, oh, I can craft my own life. And Salesforce is part of that and homeschooling is part of that. Wow, this was such a great episode. I don't have kids, but if I did, I would definitely homeschool them. Now you all have convinced me. And I know each and every one of you has a lot of resources for any parents that are out there that are interested in homeschooling their kids. So you can go to the show notes of this episode and we'll drop the links to all the awesome resources there. I just wanted to thank all of you, April, Josh, Talia, for coming on this panel. You've been great. For anyone out there listening who is thinking about homeschooling their kids, but they can't afford it, if you want to get a job that allows you to make enough money so your spouse can stay home and homeschool your kids, or you can be like April and juggle both, you have the option with a Salesforce career, head over to talentstacker.com forward slash start. And if you are enjoying episodes like this and other episodes of the show, please just click subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on and feel free to go ahead and give us a review. And we do appreciate those five-star reviews like a lot. And if you can give us a written review, that's awesome too. We always love hearing your feedback. And with that, we are going to wrap this episode. So until next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. To get started for free on your own Salesforce career, go to talentstacker.com forward slash start or check the show notes. There you'll find all the resources you need to start earning 60 to 80,000 in as little as eight months, no matter your education or career background. The Salesforce for Everyone podcast was produced by Edmund T and engineered by Andrew Mendonca. If you like what we do at this Scrappy Can Do podcast, please help others find us by leaving a five-star rating and a great review on whichever platform you're listening to us right now. See you next time.